The Secrets of Star Trek is brought to you by the Star Quest Production Network and is made possible by our many generous patrons. If you'd like to support the podcast, please visit sqpn.com slash give. You're listening to The Secrets of Star Trek, where we discuss the hidden layers and deeper meanings found in all the Star Trek TV series, movies, and more. And today we're discussing the latest Star Trek Picard episode, Two of One. I'm Don Bettinelli, and joining me today on the panel are Father Corey Stika. Hi, Father Corey. How's it going, Don? Very well, thanks. And Jimmy Akin. Hey, Jimmy. Howdy, Don. Uh, folks, be sure to stick around to the end. We've got some great listener feedback on our most recent episode. Uh, I also want to encourage you to share the podcast with your friends. Uh, help us grow this community of Trekkies and uh, reach more listeners. Uh, it's been great seeing uh, more and more of you join in the community and uh, we get feedback from you and that sort of thing. So it's awesome. I want to tell you about another show in the network you're sure to enjoy called The Secrets of Stargate. You can check that out at sqpn.com slash Stargate or wherever fine podcasts are found. Uh, so, Jimmy, could you give us a recap of Two of One? Last time, Picard and the gang were on the verge of infiltrating the super special extra chocolate fudgy going away party for his ancestor, astronaut Rene Picard. This time they get in, but to do so, Agnes has to rely on the Borg Queen uh, inside her head for help. This starts a pattern of the Queen exercising more and more control over her, and the Queen eventually assimilates Agnes and takes her body out on the town for a night of fun. Meanwhile, back at the party, Rene decides to quit the Europa mission. To get history back on track, Picard goes to talk with her, but Adam Sung shows up and tries to stick security on him. With the Queen's help, Agnes does a show-stopping singing number as a distraction. This lets Picard get away, impersonate a security guard, and talk Renee back onto the mission. But Soong isn't done trying to stop Renee, so he tries to vehicular homicide her. <laughs> Picard pushes her out of the way, and she ends up going into quarantine for the mission. But Picard is seriously injured, so they take him to Rios's cute doctor love interest friend Teresa for treatment. She fixes his body, but something weird is going on with his head. He's obsessing over some memory that's keeping him from waking up. And Supervisor Talon proposes using her powers to go inside his head for some informal psychotherapy. Meanwhile, Adam Sung goes home and has an uncomfortable conversation with his, doc with his daughter, Corey, which prompts her to Google her father for the first time in her life. <laughs> <laughs> leading her to discover that he's a disgraced mad scientist. She also finds a bunch of family photos, videos, and video log entries that reveal her father has been timeless childing her, and she is apparently one in a series of numerous genetic experiments he has been performing and that all of her predecessors have died. The end. Horrifying. <laughs> yep. So uh, before we get into this episode, I want to first start with, I, we have more listener feedback later, but I want to start with a theory that one of our patrons came up with. And uh, and I think it, I'd love to have it up front. Um, the, our patron, Hot Glue Gunslinger, said, uh, what if making Rene go on the Europa mission is what actually creates the alternate future? What if the sentient organism they say she, she brings back from the mission does bad things and it's Adam Sung who comes up, we know that it's Adam Sung, who comes up with the safe galaxy is a human galaxy uh, and creates this fascist future. And, and so he's the one who, who reacts against the bad things that the sentient microorganism uh, does and, and creates that bad future. What do you think of that theory that it's Rene, the, 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 it's we turn things on the head and Picard should be trying to stop Rene from going? What do you think of that? So I would say that it's an interesting theory, and it's I've been contemplating that because back when they first mentioned that she found this microorganism that she believed to be sentient, it's like, okay, that would be major if if there had been a discovery of a sentient microorganism in uh, in the tw in in the early twenty first century. Why have we never heard about that before? Um, mm -hmm. And because that would be huge. Now, one issue we're dealing with here is the difference between sentient and sapient. S technically, properly, sentient means you have feeling. 
Um, so, you know, uh, you can, you can feel things, you can sense things. Um, sapient means you have wisdom and, but mm. the way this commonly works in science fiction, especially TV science fiction is they treat sentient as if it meant sapient. So any sentient life form is an intelligent life form in science fiction, TV science fiction, even though it really would just mean it's got feeling. Um, but okay. Bringing back microorganisms to earth is a bad idea in general. <laughs> And bringing back uh, a, a microorganism that is intelligent would be exceedingly a bad idea. And so I could see how that could lead to a nightmare future. And I, I wouldn't put it past the, um, the, uh, the writers to want to do a last minute switcheroo on us as a twist mm -hmm. and say Picard actually needed to not be doing this. That would make sense dramatically. However, because Picard and the gang, or at least Picard, remembers this from their own timeline, that would suggest that mm -hmm. Rene Picard does go on the mission and does find this monstrosity organism that no one should ever bring back to Earth under any circumstances. Mm -hmm. right. um, yeah. Funny you should say monstrosity. <clears throat> the next episode is called Monsters, but uh, I'm not sure it oh. refers to that. Um, Probably we'll, not. We'll get to that. Um, all right. So let's let's talk about this episode. And by the way, if that turns out to be true, all credit goes to Hot Glue Gunslinger for for coming up with that. Uh, first. <laughs> so uh, this episode, it starts with. This episode is short. What's going on with the episodes yeah. getting shorter? Yeah. How They're long not, was this? 35? Uh, it is, it's like 36 or something. It was in the 30s, in the high 30s. Um, yeah. and And it's not the only episode recently that has been short. Um, these, you know, are, now that we're in a... Uh, in a streaming environment, episodes can be any length, but normally producers have used that to go a little bit longer right. and have episodes that are an hour long instead of just yeah. 44 minutes long or 42 minutes long. But lately on Picard, things have been getting shorter. And on the one hand, I appreciate they're not padding them out to be 50 minutes instead of, I mean, if they've only got 36 minutes of story, I'd rather see a 36 minute story than a 36 minute story that's been padded out to 50. Um, but on the other hand, short episode, what, <laughs> what, what's up? I mean, come on. And not just a short episode, but a short episode that they had to pad out by interspersing the flashbacks forward, you know, jumping forward and back between Picard hurt and what led up to him being hurt. Right. That bad, which is one of my least favorite of all dramatic tropes is the false drama of um, showing you something bad has happened and then going back in time to previously, you know, or earlier. And the, so that you have this false drama of knowing that the bad thing is coming. Um, instead yes, of just telling the story because right. Dom has an allergy to analepsis. Oh, I hate it. I hate one it. Of, one, of, <laughs> one of the most common uh, tropes in literature. And unfortunately, Dom's just allergic to it. I, yes, I, I am. I, <laughs> I think it becomes a crutch for... for, for it can. Yeah. I, I even commented that, the, you know, this week, which is Holy Week in the, the, the Roman Catholic Church, amongst, amongst other uh, Christian denominations, we kind of do that liturgically where we jump forward to the passion of our Lord, the death of our Lord, and then all of Holy Week is going back a week and rolling right. forward up to that again. moment. We read the Passion you know? uh, readings on Palm Sunday. On Sunday. Which is stupid. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> we should read the Triumphal Entry on Palm Sunday and read the Passion on Good Friday. Yes. And, right. Which we we do, but there's 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 liturgical reasons, historical liturgical reasons why yeah, we do this. They, but, they but that, that'll, that'll be for the the series, the secrets of liturgy <laughs> that <laughs> right. may come out someday. It's a whole other discussion. Um, so we open to having Picard injured, lying on the floor somewhere, or lying on the ground, or something like that. I think it's on the ground. Eventually, we find out mm -hmm. uh, having flashbacks to his childhood um, and bad things happening to his mother, apparently at the hands of his father. Uh, we're not quite sure. Um, it's and then, really too chaotic to tell. Yeah. yeah. And then we jump 34 minutes earlier uh, and we, to when they're still trying to break into the party. Um, Agnes is uh, handcuffed in the security office and uh, she releases a gas that knocks out the other security people in the, in the room. But she did so at a point where she hasn't been able to get the 
uh, cuff key. She can't get close to the uh, the people mm -hmm. the, uh, that are in there so she can free herself. So she has to give the queen some control of her body uh, in order to get loose. And she's then able, she then has superhuman strength and is able to just snap the handcuffs. Yes. Right. Yeah, I like how the queen, now, it's okay, so this queen is the most relaxed human-like queen we have ever seen. Yes. Yeah. She is, she is very relaxed. She's very, you know, go with the flow, but ultimately I'm going to seize control of you. Um, and she is, she has a sense of fun. You know, mm -hmm. she's, she's like, okay, now we're at the party, let's play. And she then has some lines about, you know, stress hormones and stuff. And, and, you know, I think I've had a little enough of cortisol right now. So let's play and have fun. Um, yeah. She then apparently goes out uh, at the end of the episode. We see the last shot is we see the queen in control of Agnes walking down the streets of Los Angeles at night mm -hmm. to go have fun. And what that's going to mm -hmm. mean will be interesting to see. Yeah. But um, she is she's very, very different from other board queens. And I'm not sure how believable that is. I think the switch came after that first time um, Agnes went into her head, like they connected because mm -hmm. before that she was still fairly alien. But after mm -hmm. that, there was there was a shift in the and how the board queen was being played. And I think that's what it's supposed to be is it's a subtle thing. And I I think they even show that in the makeup because I remember us commenting when we first saw the Borg Queen that she looked much more alien and not as, you know, you know, like pockmarks and things like that. She looked very different than she does now. And I think they, you know, with them going back in time, going before the whole temporal split and all that, that they changed her makeup so she looks much more human and, like you said, much more relaxed, much more, you know, that, that mm -hmm. kind of. Yeah. Attitude. They also portrayed in her makeup as well. Connected with this, now we've we've mentioned previously on the show a, a theory that Agnes may be the new Borg queen that shows up with the hood mm -hmm. in mm -hmm. episode one. So it may not be the entire Borg. So what I was thinking about is, so maybe the Borg queen's idea of fun is let's go assimilate a bunch of people. And yeah. um, and maybe she forms a new board collective, and that's what's trying to join the Federation, because they oh. indicated that board ship had come through time, right. and so maybe they maybe they originated in the twenty first century, and so it maybe it's Agnes Queen with a bunch of new assimilates trying to join the um, Federation. And that would make sense because the the ship that came through did not was not a sphere; it wasn't a cube like we'd seen before, you know, simple geometric structures. It was a very different structure. Mm -hmm. It was kind of spider crab-like. Um, one of the, um, so what was I? A, a, one, oh, that, I know what the other thing I was going to mention was. Um, so Agnes may get permanently Borgified here. Um, she, there, it appears... So there was an announcement recently that um, the third and final season of Picard is going to put the band back together. We're going to have mm -hmm. apparently the entire crew from Next Gen doing on some kind of galaxy saving mission um, in season three, including Brent Spiner. And I'm not sure what role he's going to play, mm. but his voice was in the trailer. And so that means they may be phasing out the La Serena crew by the end of this season. And so I wouldn't take their safety f as guaranteed. <laughs> um, but uh, so, you know, be aware that Agnes may not come out of this the way she is now. Right. I'm kind of thinking that's the case of, of uh, with this. Um, yeah. <laughs> by, by the way, since we commented on the flashbacks, let me uh, comment about, one of my peeves, I mean, your peeve was the flashback itself. Yeah. One of my peeves is contained in the flashbacks where they are saying medical nonsense about mm -hmm. Picard to mm -hmm. dramatize the situation. So like in the flashbacks, we see him, you know, laying on the ground injured. Then we see in another flashback, we see him 
being hooked up to a heart monitor in in the clinic and so forth. And they're saying he's flatlining. And I'm going, no, no, he's not flatlining. Look at the monitor. He is (laughs) clearly not flatlining. And then they say at another point that he's got an abnormal arrhythmia. And I'm going, no, he's he does not have an abnormal arrhythmia. Look at the monitor. (laughs) He's he's got a preternaturally precise heartbeat that no yep. human would ever have <laughs> this is his heartbeat is absolutely regular um right. and this is common on uh, medical shows where they they have the the heart monitor in a in a default like test mode and mm-hmm. it delivers this impossibly regular heartbeat and then they just interpret it ridiculously. But really, it's like you look at the at a rhythm like that, and it's like, oh wow, this guy must have an artificial heart. This is impossibly regular. <laughs> right. Yeah. Um, also, later yeah. on, uh, they say that his synapses are all firing, and I'm going, no, they're not, because that's not how the brain works. All of your <laughs> synapses do not go off all at once. If it did, it would cause horrible damage to your brain because of the release of all the chemicals all at once. Yeah. Although. Yeah. Uh, positronic brain so which, well yeah, yeah but they don't know that but yeah. in any event um this is a brain myth that we only use part of our brain and you could theoretically turn it all on all at once right, right. and for those who don't know arrhythmia means in a regular rhythm of the yeah. heart and when it gets too severe it can cause real serious health issues yeah. because your heart is not beating regularly enough for the blood to go through your body yeah. right also, um, they later use a defibrillator. This is towards the end of the episode, but they use a def- oh, it's kind of in the middle. They use a defibrillator to shock Picard's heart back into rhythm. And the defibrillator itself sparks apparently in a way that they're not expecting. And the subtext is that's because he's uh, that's because he's Robo Picard. And so our devices are working on him a little differently. But the idea that a defibrillator should work on a robot is ridiculous on its face Mm -hmm. Um, because a robotic heart is, I mean, whether it operates on a Wankel rotary engine principle or something else, um, it's, it's not, it's like trying to fix your car by using a defibrillator. (laughs) It's, it's, this device is not designed to do that. (laughs) Right. It's like smacking the side of the, of the, of it to make it work right. Yeah. You know, one of the other things, the problems I have with the flashback is the improbability of the timeline that they propose. Mm-hmm. Like the 30, 30, like, so we, the, the episode itself, right, we mentioned is like around 35 minutes long. So the episode starts with 35 minutes earlier. So we're, I think we're meant to believe that this all happens in real time, right? That, uh, more or, or less, at least up to the point of him, well, of being in the uh, clinic. Yeah. Yeah. And something or being hit. So and when he gets hit, it's about 14 minutes before the events of being in the clinic. So I also believe that he gets hit by the car. He's laying on the ground for some period of time. They scoop him up somehow and somehow transport him all the way to this clinic that's in a bad neighborhood, you know, or, or a neighborhood of I mean, the immigrants or, or that sort of thing. And 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 call you know, Dr. Teresa and all the other stuff in 14. And, it's just, and she gets there that fast too. Yeah. It's, it's that's like, if you're going to do it, make it believable. Like, think about it for like, it's the sloppiness that gets me. It's just sloppy. Mm-hmm. It's just, yeah. you know, if, if, if you had set this in a town, like where I live here, you know, population of 600 people, I could say, Oh, absolutely. This is plausible. Right. I could plausibly say, you know, you were at the local restaurant and you went to the fire station, which is just across the street. And the person lives two blocks away. Absolutely can see that. But yeah, Los Angeles isn't a town of 600 people. Yeah. Get across LA to, in 11 you know, minutes. A lot more I, than that. Yeah, yeah. You, nobody gets across LA in 11 minutes. Um, <laughs> you don't get the, across the street in uh, 11 minutes in Los I Angeles. Although I suppose <laughs> transport would be, I suppose, would be the possibility. They transport. Well, it, oh, yeah, still. maybe. Um, I, I once, it, uh, especially like on Sunday afternoons, and now this is true to a good extent every day, but especially on Sunday afternoons, um, traffic between LA and San Diego is horrendous. Theoretically, it should take 90 minutes to get up to mm-hmm. LA. But I once had to, uh, on a Sunday, deliver a friend up to Hollywood and then drive back to San Diego. It took me five 
hours oh. to get back to San Diego for what should have been a 90 minute trip oh. without traffic. Oh, that's mm. you were a good friend. <laughs> <laughs> that, that, that's where I would have been going across San Diego just to drop them off at the train station and say, have fun. Take a boat. So um, one, one other thing I want to mention is when we got introduced to, to the concept of the Watcher and to Lynn, like we were led to believe that she's dangerous, powerful, you know, you, she's maybe She'll even- she bite your eyelids off. Right, mercurial. Yeah. This to Lynn is friendly. I mean, she's maybe a little bit uh, uh, wary, but she's nowhere near no. the, the character that we were led to believe. And I'm like, well, what, did you, what was all that buildup for? It was fake. It was fake buildup. Well, and not just not just this idea of being, you know, aggressive and all that, but she's very, you know, almost overcautious and timid. And yeah, it's very strange. The difference, yeah. the whole we never make contact with the people we're helping thing. Also, I mean, she objects to Picard making contact with mm -hmm. with her. And it's like, OK, how do you ever have an influence on these people? How do you actually protect them? Right. Yeah, I mean, I can, just, I, I can understand maybe saying, well, I'm the leader of this team, so I never see her. But some somehow you're having an influence over this person. How right. are you doing that? I was gonna, you could argue, you know, some behind the scenes like, well, she, you know, she got through school so quickly because she was able to influence the teachers and the principals and so on. And, but I mean, this this is all headcanon. There's right. nothing exposed about this in the series. Well, also, massive plot hole. She has this ability to mind control people, take control of their bodies, make them talk and do things from a distance. So why didn't she do that to upload the IDs into the database so they could get into the gala? Uh, I think perhaps because um, even if she is able to hold all the data for the IDs in, in her head, because it includes life histories, uh -huh. mm -hmm. there's no way to speedily get it out of the person she's possessing. Well, I mean, and so you need yeah. you need like a thumb drive, right? That so has all a that thumb data. drive. Yeah. Well, you could do that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I just you think, could have a scene where from one guard to the next, you know, or something like that. Exactly. You know? That's what I was thinking. It's like, I mean, it's the 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 eyes turning white, maybe a, a clue, but it didn't seem to bother her when it was out in public. So, you know, who knows? But yeah. um, it's just as it, they've created this character, and then they, it's like they've changed the character. It's a different mm -hmm. person now. Yeah, they may give us explanations for this down the line, but I agree that right now this character is seems very ad hoc. Yeah, yeah. Um, and the whole Laris thing, uh, which is which still yet to be resolved. Yeah. By the way, sp speaking of other characters, so um, in addition, like I, in episode, what was it, episode two, end of episode two, where they have that meaningful moment Oh, just a glance between Agnes and the Queen, and I said, "Oh, that's going somewhere." Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, well, this episode has some of that for Rafi. Rafi also is going to hit bottom at some point, um, and we see that in two ways. At the party, she hallucinates Elnor briefly. Mm -hmm. You know, she just looks over and sees Elnor at another table, and then he's not there. Um, and when she goes up to the bar. There's this bottle of whiskey sitting sitting on the bar, and we get this close up of her hands by the bottle of whiskey. But then she orders club soda, and yep. so it's like, okay, so she's going to go off the wagon at some point. She's mm -hmm. she's she's going to get drunk, and it's going to cause problems and things like that. Right, she's um, going to cause more problems than she already has. That's <laughs> yeah. yeah. Also, uh, Rios is um, is infatuated with the 21st century. Everything oh, yeah. is. Uh, much more exciting for him and intense and the cigars are better because they're not replicated yes. and the food is amazing because it's not replicated and he's falling in love with Dr. Teresa and, mm -hmm. and, and um, Rafi tries to talk him out. It's like, don't even go there in your mind. Um, you know, the time travel romances are not good. <laughs> um, right. Yeah. But clearly it's going there. Although when we meet Teresa later on, she's really ticked off at him mm -hmm. um, and a little unjustifiably so, I thought. Um, but uh, but in any event, you know, there's there's that's another thread that's going to be played out as well. So yes. I don't I could see. Um, well, I don't know exactly. I know Rafi's going to hit bottom, but I don't know what happens after that. I could mm -hmm. see Rio staying. Mm -hmm. And I could see Agnes 
becoming the new queen. And so we made uh, seven, presumably. Well, actually, probably what they're going to do is they're going to they're going to unless they really want to do a tragic love theme, they're going to put they're, seven and Rafi will end up together. But yeah. um, other members of the crew may not may not be may not be regular members of the crew next season is what I'm right. saying. Right. Well, and it's, I mean, talking about that, you know, the third season being kind of the, the reunion of all the TNG crew, it is very possible that the, they're going to basically parcel this, these crew out. And yeah, I, you know, with everything with Rios, how he keeps, Oh, the cigars are so wonderful. The food is so flavorful and all this and this. And Oh yeah, by the way, this doctor is really cute and I like her a lot. Yeah, he's not leaving. Well, this, he's he's a starship captain, and he's apparent, presumably what it was something he's wanted for a long time. So even if he does go back, he's presumably going to be off on the Stargazer, you know, in in season three. And like they don't need to bring him back for season three. I I do think that they've got seven is going to be in it because I saw a tweet from the actress Jerry Ryan. Jerry Ryan uh, yeah. that where she said, and that's a series wrap on Picard. So mm -hmm. I, I could I could see her continuing because she's obviously coming in from Voyager instead of TNG, but yeah. she's yeah. still she's still a you know Star Trek veteran. So um, yep. in any case, uh, we see Deborgified Seven um, is a lot more fun and carefree in this time period too. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. with, without the Borg implants, so there's a lot of personality changes going on in in yeah. this. Uh, so. Makes and, you and I, Speaking I, of, oh, I will ahead. I will say that they they've made the 21st century plot more interesting than I was afraid. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, because I was like, I do not want to spend the bulk of this season in the 21st century. But they've mm -hmm. actually made it interesting enough that um that I'm not minding it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Spe speaking of personality changes, I've got Pat Benatar running through my head really badly. <laughs> okay. I You're really singing shadows of the night. Yeah. That was so cringy. I, I like and unbelievable. Like she just steps out in the darkness and then a, a spotlight, the spotlight guy just knows to show her to show a spotlight on her. And the band just knows to join in. Well, like it just was well, all the lights turn off, except the spotlight still works. It was so weird. Like, what like what was yeah just... so for people who haven't seen it we should explain the queen mm -hmm. inside who's got nanites inside agnes uses the nanites to send out an electrical pulse well actually let's back up so adam sung shows up at the party right yes and he intercepts picard who's going to talk to um to renee to talk her back onto the mission because she's just texted q who's posing as her therapist, that she decided to quit the mission, and he affirmed that. Um, and so Picard goes to talk to her, to talk her back onto the mission, and Adam Soong suddenly shows up at the party. And he and Picard have some tense words. Uh, Adam says, uh, you know, we seem to have a friend in common, and Picard realizes he's talking about Q and says he's not a friend, and Adam says, funny, that's what he said about you. And um, and it turns out he's just made a massive donation to some foundation that is behind the Europa mission. And he's now, as a result of that donation, he's on their board. Yep. And he um, and he and Picard both tell each other they can't they're not going to let each other stop each other. You know, mm -hmm. we're 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 both going to you're going to pursue your thing. I'm going to pursue my thing. And. And we'll see who wins in essence. And um, and I'm thinking, OK, he's he's on the board. He's got authority now. But how is he going to pull this off? How is he going to effectively stop Picard in such a short space of time? I mean, you can't mm -hmm. it's not like the board's going to have a meeting in the next five minutes and hold a vote. Um, I'm on enough boards. I know how that works. <laughs> and, and, <laughs> yep. and, and, it, you know, so, okay, you got, you're now a board member, you got some authority, but, um, or at least you have a vote, but how is, how are you going to thwart Picard in just a few seconds? Cause he's going to go talk to Renee now. And the way they did it, I thought was really nice. Um, the, one of the other board members comes over and is kind of squiring, uh, Adam away, and as as they're walking off, we hear Adam say, "That man is dangerous." 
Mm-hmm. And it's like, yep, at the super secret chocolate fudgy going away party with the appallingly amazing security. That's all yeah. you need to say. If you're a board member and you say that man is dangerous, mm-hmm. that will get security to take action right now. Exactly. And, and so that's what prompts uh, the distraction that Agnes creates. Um, the queen is uh, pushing Agnes towards this, and she uses the nanites to create an electrical pulse that knocks out the lights, at least for a second. And then Agnes comes in and starts singing, and they the the band recognizes what she's singing and starts playing, and someone turns on a spotlight and things like that. And she does this she does this musical number that distracts everybody long enough for Picard to impersonate a security guard yeah <laughs> and go talk to renee yeah and you don't see don't see him get the security card badge or whatever um but uh, just well, all of a sudden he's got one yeah, rios you know, gave actually it rios gives it to him somehow yeah, rios okay. got it yeah do you think that the security guard who detained agnes might like remember her? she's kind of memorable you know like might, might have remembered detaining her and wondering why she's out here singing a song distracting well, everybody <laughs> I, it, there was be. kind of a quick throwaway line that whatever knockout gas they used gave him short term memory loss. Oh, that's well, right. But he wasn't in. Well, I, I don't think he was in the room, but that's OK. Well, it's it will, they're not going to go up to as, it, you know, yeah. the security guards aren't going to rush the, the stage when everybody's, you know, sure. transfixed on this performance. Um, I, I do have to comment, though. Uh, so spent a lot of money to get on a board to make changes and drives a Tesla. Adam Soong is Elon Musk proven. <laughs> yeah, Elon Musk, of course, news yeah. today that he didn't actually go on the board, but Elon Musk bought a bunch of Twitter. Yeah. 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 Soong wanted to put an edit button on the Europa mission, but. Uh... Yep. He, he did end up on the board, though. Did, yeah. This morning it, it came out that he, he actually refused it, it because oh. there were too many restrictions. Oh, good. That's even better. Mm-hmm. Yes. Doesn't want to be so. constrained. Yeah. Because they, they tried to uh, impose a, as long as you're on the board and for some period of time thereafter, you can't acquire majority stakeholder status. So he's keeping Unless his option. Buy everything. Yeah. He's keeping his option open to acquire majority stakeholder status in Twitter. Yay. And he will take over yep. the Europa mission. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so the. Uh, Mars, Mars. Mars. Yes, that's right. So. Uh, the endorphins that Agnes gets from performing in front of the crowd, the queen reveals that her plan was to get those. Endor- that allows the queen to take over somehow. Uh, now that the cortisol is down uh, and the endorphins have risen, it gives her control of Agnes. Um, you, however, we, that happens. Let's, let's just go. She, she lives off endorphins. Uh, who knows? Yeah. Maybe that's what feeds the nanites. So Picard goes to Renee. Uh, finds her in this exhibit area and uh, talks to her. Um, and there's actually a really nice uh, moment where um, she's talking, they're talking about fear and how fear is, you know, paralyzes her. And uh, if Picard says fear, fear, it doesn't mean anything except fear. Fear is fear. It's, it, it doesn't have uh, control of you. It doesn't speak in riddles. Fear means you're smart. It means you understand the risks. In other words, being afraid is not the problem. What's the the problem is when you let fear take over. Not for people with anxiety disorders like Rene Picard. They don't mm-hmm. understand the risks. The right, risks yeah. are not as great as they're thinking. Right, right. Usually, if, yeah. if you have an anxiety, uh, I'm, and I'm intimately in, uh, aware of anxiety disorders, uh, having that uh, mental health problem in my own family. Um, so, right, it, it, you can't reason the anxiety out of someone with a, with a clinical anxiety disorder. Which, like as you mentioned, she's she's uh, apparently she's got. clearly got yeah yeah. So while uh, Picard and Renee are walking outside the building to get back into the gala for because it's shorter or something, um, Sung, as you mentioned, uh, decides to you know instead of he could have saved a lot of money, but basically instead of buying his way into the board, he could have just waited outside with his car. He he tries to hit run down Renee with his car, um, instead hits Picard. And he has to be taken to Teresa's clinic. And uh, when the doctor, when Teresa defibrillates him, Picard shorts it out. Sung, meanwhile, is talk- talks to Corey. He talks yeah, about and, her. Like- and that's probably what would happen if you took a defibrillator to your car engine and turned it on. The, exactly. Probably hurt yeah. the defibrillator more than the car. Right. <laughs> <laughs> then we have the scene where Sung, we mentioned where Sung and Corey talk. And, Co- and Sung talks about her like she's a thing, like something she's he's made, his life's work. You know, you, you, it starts mm-hmm. to become clear that 
while he treasures her, he treasures her more like an object and less like a person. So I thought that was interesting. I didn't fully get that from that conversation. I, it is very uncomfortable. And he he talks to her about uh, she's the reason why he's done what he's done. And mm -hmm. she is um, going, well, like, what have you done? And right, right. and and he's he doesn't come out and say it explicitly, but he's yeah. he's apparently experiencing guilt over trying to trying to commit vehicular homicide a few minutes ago. Right. Um, and and he she he says in trying to stop her, I may have stopped him or something like that. Mm -hmm. Um so there may well be object language in that discussion that I missed, but what stood out for me was he is he he is revealing to her his obsession mm -hmm. with her right. and um and that he's done monstrous things in the service of that obsession. Yeah. And she doesn't know what those are, so she starts to look him up online for the first time ever, apparently. <laughs> yeah. Well, he's got really bad password security on his computers, too. That's the... <laughs> yeah. Okay. yeah, exactly. He, he reminds me of the character, like the revelation about how he's created many, many children who he's who have died. Reminds me a little bit of Guardians of the Galaxy 2 and the character of Ego, the uh, super being mm -hmm. um, who does... The living planet. Yes, does yep. essentially the same sort of thing. Um, so I thought yeah. that was what, interesting. What struck me was the parallel with Doctor Who, where Tech Tayun has this child and runs experiments and keeps killing it over and over again in order to yep. find out what she wants. Right. And make a technological advance. So it struck, it reminded me of the timeless child. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I right. also have in my notes that um, another, po another prediction for how the plot may go, um, Corey may commit suicide or try to commit suicide in order to stop Adam Sung. Right. Mm. That's probably going to be, yeah, that's, that's probably going to happen. And it's probably going to be something where she's just going to walk outside or something like that. And he's going to see her and be too late. Yep. Or... By the way, did you notice that the clinic is called La Mariposa, which is Spanish for butterfly? Uh, and we've mm. been talking about the butterfly effect and uh -huh. the whole thing. So I thought that mm. was kind of an, a little Easter egg they threw in there. Mm -hmm. Um, at one point, uh, uh, was it Rios says, trust me, we're the good guys. And Teresa says, good guys never say that. And I'm thinking. Yeah, they do. Sure they do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like that's a, yeah, well, yeah we, otherwise, how would you ever know who the good guys were? Like, I, it's just you weird. mean good guys don't all wear white hats and bad guys don't all wear black hats? Yeah, I, I guess. it's That was a weird comment. Um, and then we wrap things up where Rafi says, after everything else that's happened, how much worse can it get? Which is one of those things you never say in a movie or a TV show because it always gets worse after that. Uh, because then we get the pick the image of Agnes slash the queen walking down the street in L.A. to have fun. Menacing, menacing music behind her. Yes. Um, so and that's that's where we end. Um, any uh, final thoughts, Father Corey? So when the Picards are talking, they're in this museum type place and they're standing underneath the OV-165 Spike shuttle, mm -hmm. which was on the Enterprise opening credits. Star Trek Enterprise opening credits was oh, one yeah. of the shuttles that they showed. Uh, okay. there, there's also uh, was oh, I, I, I miss a uh, nomad from TOS. You guys would know mm -hmm. nomad yeah. Yeah. more than I would. But that that's behind Jean-Luc Picard. Right. You see a model of that. I mean, I feel like we've and, clearly and, decided and, we're in a and, different timeline than the one we're in. Yeah. Yeah. And the Nomad probe would make sense. I forget if they, uh, what dates they established in the original series for the Nomad probe, but, um, but we did recently see Jackson Roykirk Plaza, and yeah. Jackson Roykirk was the designer of Nomad. Right. 2002. Okay. Uh, anything, uh, Jimmy, any finalists on your, your part? During the flashback, so the, during the conversation with, uh, with Renee, Picard says that um, you remind me of my mother. Uh, she also loved the stars and struggled. Um, and she, he's not specific on what kinds of issues she struggled with. But, um, but there is a parallel there. I mean, you got this astronaut with mental health issues. Um, in the course of this, we also see flashbacks to when he was a boy, and they're very turbulent. But one of the things his mom says in the flashbacks is, Jean-Luc, come and find me. 
And mm. I'm expecting we're going to get that paid off next episode when uh, Talon goes into his head to deal with these childhood memories. We're finally going to find out more about what was going on. Mm. Yeah. Maybe the tunnels under the, the chateau. Perhaps. Yeah, and that could be why it's called monsters because it may the monsters Monst- may be monsters of the id, mm-hmm. monsters in the dark. Yep, yep, very good. So I mentioned we had some feedback from our last episode on uh, "Fly Me to the Moon," and our first bit of feedback comes from Son of Hanser on our Star our uh, Starquest Discord, and he said. Uh, couple of things from the episode. I'm in the UK, and we have a different approach to firearms, but is it likely an abandoned chateau is going to have a loaded shotgun on the wall that Agnes is sleeping in? Two points here. One, is it reasonable? And two, is it more a cultural thing? It really stood out to me, but wasn't mentioned on the show. Uh, it might say more about me. So um, I don't know about the culture in France when it comes to <laughs> firearms. Here in America, I mean... People will have, you know, defense around their homes mm-hmm. and even even in a home that you aren't using a lot, like let's say you got a cabin up in the woods, you may right. keep a shotgun up there. And if unless you've got small children around, it could be a loaded shotgun. Um, I don't know that I would. I mean, if it were my cabin, I wouldn't put it right over the fireplace where it's easy to see. If yeah. I'm not, mm-hmm. if I'm not there, I'm I'm much more cautious than that. Um, but there are a lot of Americans who are not as cautious as I am. <laughs> yeah. So uh, well, so so I really wasn't concerned of the fact there was a loaded shotgun. Um, I, not for those reasons, but. Um, I did wonder, well, wait, if no Picards have lived in this house for a hundred years, who put it there? And, you know, why has to fire if this, if this, well, and I wondered about how, how well it would fire. Um, and I also wondered, you know, why hasn't it been looted if this house is open to the elements? Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's the thing. Well, and, and having a mounted historical firearm is a thing. And, and a lot of people yeah. don't, but it is very much a thing. But those guns usually are rendered inoperable. Um, inoperable. You can't use them. You can't load, you know, you can't, a lot of them, you can't even load ammo into them to actually even try to fire them. And, and they've had, had to have the, one sitting had the fire, there on the, They've had the firing pin removed and things like that. Sometimes they, they, purposely plug the barrel and things like that mm-hmm. too, just inside of it so that it just, it can't even, you can't even try to make it operable again. Yeah. You know, so, you know, it's, it, uh, so have some like mount over a, a fireplace. Absolutely. You could, you'd have a like historical shotgun like that, but yeah, to have it where either the shotgun is still operable and the ammo is elsewhere, which again, if it hasn't been used since the Nazis occupied it, that ammo won't be sitting there, <laughs> yeah. you know, it won't be working. That's for sure. Um, so, uh, Son of Hanser also said uh, that people keep appearing like the Laris lookalike, Dr. Sung and his daughter, that are familiar to the main characters. I'm hoping this doesn't turn out to all be a dream. No, it won't. Yes. This won't be a dream. <laughs> it's, just, it's just like Dr. Who, where you have the same faces repeat over and over yeah, again. Right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and by the way, on, on uh, mounted uh, shotguns for artistic purposes, of course, sometimes they are useful, usable, as in, um, as in Shaun of the Dead. <laughs> will you, will you, uh, <laughs> Great movie. Turn around and use the stock as a bludgeon. Uh, yeah. Yes. So, uh, and then uh, Hot Glue Gunslinger, who we talked about earlier in the episode, also had some other feedback, uh, who said, I've been disappointed with the past several episodes of Picard season two. It seems to me that the previous four episodes could have been condensed, and what we have been offered is nothing more than Pillar Filler, a reference to uh, previous, uh, the late Star Trek writer Michael Pillar. It's like the writers don't have a serious grasp of the story, which is sad because the new story could nearly write itself, but we're being spoon-fed with processed nuggets and visual callbacks, a common trope within the genre. I hope the show gets better. I think, you know, I, I kind of ad- agree with that with the last two episodes that it they've kind of stretched them out a little bit longer than they need to. And their first couple episodes, I, I thought, moved pretty well. But I, definitely yeah. these this this episode, especially, you know, I made that comment about even at, you know, 35 minutes, not counting the credits. It's still they had to stretch it, you know, with doing the back and forth with the, the clinic. When we have so few episodes in a season, it's disappointing to have anything that feels like filler. You know, and mm-hmm. and it's I think it's the part of the problem of seasons that are one story 
So then you've only you've got to fill up that period of time with one story as opposed to like where we're going to go with Strange New Worlds, which is apparently the more traditional. Each episode is a different self-contained story. Picaresque. Yes. Yep. Uh, so, yeah, I, I agree that it feels so, like some of these have been you could have condensed the story down into a, a, instead of the like the last four episodes could have been condensed into two, maybe. Um I, on the but on the other hand, I'm not. I don't feel like that the story is, uh, is is as bad as you might make it out to uh, be in the, in your in your comment. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think it's better than 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 that myself. I don't think it's um, filler and processed nuggets of story. I, I think it's actually doing pretty good. This isn't Discovery season four. <laughs> I mean, yeah. that, the entire main plot of Discovery season four could be told in a good two parter. Yeah. And they took 10 episodes of fluff to do it. I, I, you know, I, I recognize the validity of the, of the, of the viewpoint. I don't know the extent to which I share it. I think that, um, the, and I'm not entirely sure what the correspondent has in mind, but I think that it was actually good that we spent as long as we did in the dystopian alternate timeline. We needed to see that and see it in some depth um, before we go back to the 21st century. And, you know, I have various, I I have made many criticisms of, of uh, the 21st century storyline so far, but as I said earlier, I think it, it, it's, it's working enough for me that I'm still entertained by it i'm not actively resenting it the way i was afraid i might Mm. i mean we've we only spent one episode in the 20 the the alternate 24th century and now we've won one two three four and presumably five episodes in the 21st century so um Mm -hmm. you know the the balance of the being like that so um but like you said it's it's been they've done a good job with it it's been interesting enough that uh, i don't think it's suffered for that um, I agree. Uh, by the way, a note: this episode was uh, also directed by Jonathan Frakes. Just um, yep. so the last two, I think they're doing two. Like uh, every director is getting two episodes. So mm-hmm. Doug mm-hmm. Uh, Aronofsky got the first two. Leah Thompson got the next two, and now Jonathan Frakes got these two. I thought was interesting. All right, so that does it for our feedback. We'd like to take a moment to thank our patrons who make it possible for us to create the secrets of Star Trek, including Morrowind, Natasha V, Henry S. Joby W and Eric R. Their generous donations at sqpn.com slash give make it possible for us to continue the secrets of Star Trek and all the shows at StarQuest. You can join them by visiting sqpn.com slash give. So that's it from us. We'd love to hear what you think of this episode, two of one. You can let us know by commenting on the show at sqpn.com slash trek or our Facebook page at facebook.com slash StarQuest Media or send an email to track at sqpn.com, or visit our Discord community at sqpn.com slash discord. And we'll be back next time when we'll be discussing the next new episode of Picard, Monsters. Until then, Father Cory Stika, thank you for joining me and sharing the secrets of Star Trek. Thank you, Dom. And Jimmy Aiken, thank you as well. Thank you, and now let's go have fun. <laughs> <laughs> and once again, I'm Dom Bettinelli. Thank you for listening to the secrets of Star Trek on StarQuest, and remember... Fear is just fear. Fear is just fear.